Yes, there's a Hi. question. I remember learning in my first economics course that it is investment that governs the amount of savings, that companies decide what to invest and then it turns out that people save an amount that equals the total amount that's been invested in the country, that investment is the cause and savings is only an effect. Uh, I guess that theory's time has passed, or when did that uh, lose you, ground? You must have gone to school in the heydays of Keynesianism of the narrowest kind. I want to make clear that I am a Keynesian, so don't believe that I'm making this puns at Keynes, but the point is that this was in the time when it was believed that there always was a lot of unemployment. If you have unemployment, then indeed it is true that if people invest more, there is more income, and if there's more income, there's more saving to match it. But when you have reached full employment, which is where we have been throughout the post-war period, up on more or less, that's no longer true. You need saving in order to have more investment. So the, the investment take up whatever saving has been done. And let me mention in this connection that this is exactly the great, uh, I mean, the great error and the great irony of, Reagan, of Reaganomics. The so-called supply, so supply economics was supposed to create more investment by giving incentives to firms to invest, okay? I said from the beginning, what you will get is higher interest rates because you do not get more saving just because you invest more. So if, unless you have an incentive to save, you will find that you are making investment more productive and interest rates will go up, which is exactly what happens. Saving haven't changed at all, but interest rates have gone up a lot, okay? So you are right. In other words, you see, one has to learn that there are two regimes, as it were. There is a regime of unemployment in which, of course, it is important uh, anything that increases demand will produce more saving, okay? And there is no further effect. But there is the regime of full employment, uh, or near full employment, and then you have a complication, which is the regime of practically, or sh should I say, uh, of uh, intentionally less than full employment. If you think of the last four or five years, we have intentionally kept unemployment, okay? because we wanted to defeat inflation. At that time, it is as though we had full employment because firms cannot invest more unless there is more saving. They cannot invest more. They, they will not be a possibility of increasing income because we will, Mr. Falker will not allow more income and more employment. Okay? So you have really these three regimes. But that's a very good question. Right? And of course, you see, in some sense, you're really touching on a very important point. The whole emphasis of the Keynesian period was completely different. In fact, the emphasis would be on investment, not on what makes people save. But if you look at the long sweep of history, the important thing is what makes people save. Okay, any other? Oh, oh. I'm, I'm trying to mull around the consequences of, of your statement, which, which I understand, that high interest rates increase consumption. Right. And it strikes me that, that somehow that's an instability in the system, because if high saving rates increase consumption, there's less savings available, so interest rates ought to go back up. Could you comment on that? It doesn't sound like a steady state, stable system. Yes, I will come on. First of all, uh, may I commend you for making a very very sharp point. Uh, the, let's see, the question is, uh, supposing for a moment that saving could decrease with interest rates, would that not create instability? Because uh, then there the being less saving, interest rates would be even higher, and the being interest rates would give higher, you would uh, have even more saving and you'd be unstable. Well, the answer is that it depends on the slope of the saving function and the investment function. And I think I can handle this by a picture. Saving. And uh, 
interest rate, saving and investment, and interest rate. The investment, we all agree, goes like this. The more interest, the less investment. Now, suppose that the saving comes like this. Then, oh yes, okay. Suppose that the saving is very steep. Then I think you are right. Let me just be sure, because suppose that we were to shift the investment function like this, then what would happen that we would end up with a higher interest rate, less saving and less investment. So that you see that in this case there is nothing unstable. In other words, whatever, I, I'm not sure how you want to bring about the higher interest rate, but you can either shift the saving or the investment. Uh, we could shift the investment up, okay, and have a new equilibrium here. And what is strange about it is that if the investment demand rises, you end up with a lower interest rate. Why? Because the, uh, you have more saving and therefore more investment and the lower interest rate. So you get a paradox, but it's not instability. Well, this question is so good that I, you now whet my appetite. I hope that there are some more. I'm running away from this terrible light. I guess that there is no... Oh, 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 oh. Here is, uh, here is another customer. Thank you. The, the last proposition, Dr. Medigliani, that you had outlined for today's talk, you won't get till till next Wednesday, which is unfortunate for me because I'll be on the West Coast. Uh, I'm very curious what share of the $12 trillion is in fact attributable to the bequest motive? This is the last proposition you referred yes. to for today. What share of the, I see, you, you are interested in that. I'm answer. interested. I'll give you the answer. Of course, the answer is nothing. The question is how you get there. But I, I'll give you the answer. The answer is that to the best of my judgment, that is, after having studied the subject thoroughly, I believe that the proportion, well, you have to distinguish two concepts. What fraction is due to bequests and what fraction is due to the bequest motive? What's the difference? You can leave bequests without ever intending to, simply because you die before you exhausted all of your wealth. And in <coughs> fact, if you have no system of annuities, of insurance annuities, you are sure, because you cannot die with a negative number, so uh, most people must die with something positive. Now, that is a bequest. The other source of bequest is that, that comes from a person intending to accumulate or to pass on to his heirs a certain wealth. Now, if you take the two together, the share of wealth that is due to bequest is about one quarter. If you take separately the bequest motive, my judgment is that it would be more like one eight. Okay? But uh, I'm sorry you will not be here because I think I'm going to show you, I'm going to derive this result by a rather elegant way. I've worked on it very, very hard and very long. And I have some beautiful graphs due to my secretary and and all the secretaries of the floor have worked together on producing some beautiful graphs that will make perfectly clear the relation between uh, wealth and bequests. Thank you. One, one last question. Um, people talk about declining resources and reaching a steady state of use of resources and zero population growth, you know, and becoming in equilibrium, you know, with what the planet can supply. How does that affect wealth? How does that affect wealth? Yeah. It turns out that I didn't tell you, and you're right. It turns out that the saving income ratio rises with income. 
the wealth-income ratio declines with income. So a country which is absolutely stationary has more wealth per dollar of income than one that grows. Okay? Japan does not have a great deal of wealth per person. Now, part of the reason is how can they do all the factories and so on? Well, one of the reasons is that housing in Japan is so prohibitive that very few, that relatively little houses exist. So what doesn't go into housing goes into other things. But fundamentally, that result of it. See, you have to understand that a high wealth income ratio doesn't make you rich. It just says it's a ratio of two numbers. And I do not regard as particularly desirable a state of stationary economy in which there is no growth of productivity. But in terms of the wealth income ratio, it is highest there. By the way, I should add that that is one proposition which has not been verified. That is, we do not yet know much. See, we, we have a lot of income statistics, saving, consumption, and so on. But we do not have many much by way of wealth statistics. There are only a handful of countries and then a handful of years. And it's not very clear at the moment. This is a, a complicated question. Also, remember that uh, among the things that matter in terms of factories is whether that wealth is occupied by the national debt. The more debt there is, the less factories there are for a given amount of income and wealth. The relation, by the way, is not, is not very, very, it's fairly flat. But it's to quote, I think, you get five for a wealth income ratio of five if the growth is zero, and it gets to be three and a half for a growth of three and a half. Thank <laughs> you.